And don't forget to check out howtocollectcards.com, a website I created dedicated to helping collectors of all skill levels build their collections. Feeling like you just don't know where to begin, you don't know what all these different things mean within the hobby, I've created this dictionary and I'm giving it away completely free. It has over 120 terms, all the terms that you need to know to get started collecting cards. We're also offering an advanced training course that is comprised of 17 different parts, everything from learning what cards you should be focused on buying for yourself, what cards are worth, where to buy the cards, when to buy cards to save yourself the most money, how to avoid different mistakes within the hobby that a lot of people make. Uh, it's just got everything that you need to be successful collecting cards, so please check that out. We've also got a bunch of new bonus content, and any new content that I create for the training course gets added for free, so if you've bought the course already, you're gonna get all that new content, and it's free for life. I'm gonna keep adding stuff to it. There's always gonna be new content helping everyone. So please check it out. It's really extensive. It's got tons of great information. I think it's gonna bring a lot of value to a lot of people. Hey everyone, this is Josh back with Cardboard Chronicles and I've brought back the distinguished guest, Tom. And Tom is distinguished because he happens to have the record for most views of any of my videos, which is a pretty impressive feat given, you know, some of the heavy hitters I've had on like Nat and the infamous PWCC interview. So Tom, welcome back. Thanks for joining me again. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun last time. So I'm glad to be back. I think uh, we just got to give the people what they want, right? Yeah, I guess so. I just I go by the data and I see the views and this is what people want to talk about and I think a lot of it is uh you know we talked a lot about flipping and you know how to make money in cards so I think that's a pretty hot topic today whether that's you know positive or negative so we kind of get a lot of a lot of views that way but I think uh, overall it's it's pretty helpful and I think we're talking about it in a healthy way so I'm excited about this one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I remember like I think when we put up the first video like uh, the first week or something that had as many thumbs down as the thumbs up. <laughs> kind of funny but uh, you know some people aren't aren't happy with the whole flipping aspect of it but yeah i think i've said it before for me it's a it's just a way to enjoy collecting even more i you know, I kind of get a, a rush out of buying something on cheap and you know uh, moving it for a higher price but it's also the idea of you know in the end i can more own more cards that way so there's maybe something that i hold for a year and then move it on and you know, i can't keep it forever but um you just kind of need to have something that's, uh, you know, that, that you like for a while, even if you do end up having to move it. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, so why don't you start off with your update on your whole flip thread, just how, how you're doing, because you had started a thread on blog where you were tracking what you were buying, what you were selling, kind of your gains and losses. Where are you at with that now? Yeah, so just a, a real quick overview. I think it was almost maybe four or five years ago, I spent $49 on a, David DiCastro contenders card sold it for 350, um, you know, the next month and then had to decide do I spend 350 on something else and keep it or do I keep kind of investing? And it just kept doing that. And over the years started investing more and more. Um, and uh, you have know, had some great success And this last year with everything that's gone on in the NBA, especially and what's gone in the, uh, gone on in the sports card world. Um, been a lot of fun. Um, a couple of my investments have really done well. Um, and I'm still holding. So, um, yeah, there's been some, uh, some pretty good action here this last, uh, I think this 10 months since we last talked. All right. So why don't you go through and break down some of the bigger ones that you had? Yeah, there were, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, quick flips here and there, but the two biggest ones were, um, uh, I was on top of the, uh, LeBron prism silver craze. Uh, before it happens. So, you know, I, I guess the, the thing that I probably didn't tell you back then, back in uh, November of last year, December of last year was um, since the summer, whenever I saw LeBron prism silver, no matter what year I was trying to pick it up. Um, I think I picked up most of the stuff, you know, through from second year to, you know, 2018, I was picking stuff up for, you know, five, 10, $20 and just holding them. Um, you know, I didn't get any crazy sum of them. I probably picked up, you know, 20, 25 different silvers over the years or over the year, but, um, you know, I, I was getting them for dirt cheap. And then come last, uh, last early spring. So when the market really popped on them, and, you know, there were a few I did great on, um, sent a few off the PSA. So, um, some, 
uh, second year prisms that I paid about twenty dollars for. Um, two of them came back uh, PSA ten, and ended up selling those for about eight hundred a piece. Um, there was a, a two thousand sixteen Mojo that I bought for fifty dollars. Out of all places, I think it was on Beckett Marketplace. Um, it was listed as a teal. It came through. It was a Mojo. Sent it to PSA and graded a ten, and that was an easy thousand dollar sale come next March. Um, so I still have a couple of those LeBrons. I just have a couple of the PSA tens um, that I've kind of held on to, but for the most part, I uh, moved a lot of those uh, in the spring. And then, kind of the biggest one that I guess it's almost its own flip in itself um, was the other thing that I got on was um, I, I just got into this before it took off was uh, the kind of the first year Galactics, and um, I'll get more into this later. But um, one of the Galactus I picked up was a, um, a 2015 uh, Giannis for 130 bucks uh, back in July, which is like just mind blowing that it was 130 bucks what 15 months ago. Um, and I held it throughout the season as he was heating up, um, and then um, it was literally during the All Star game where he did that dunk where you know Curry bounced the ball to him. Um, I sold it for a thousand. Uh, five minutes later, I went on eBay and bought a uh, select black one of one from his second year for that same thousand dollars. So it ended up being an even swap. Um, and then two months to the date, sold that black one of one for four grand. Uh, friends and family to you know a guy that actually has the rookie year black one of one. So he was pretty eager to get it. Um, so yeah, that was a you know that was a, a quick flip from one hundred thirty to you know four thousand dollars. Um, just like that. So those are a couple of the, uh, those are a couple of the big hitters. Although I've heard, uh, you've had a couple big hitters this year. Um, season's been pretty, pretty good to you too. Yeah, it was a pretty nuts year. We bolted really well on the galactic stuff. Um, yeah. I think we kind of saw that one coming though with all the shiny stuff going up and then we hit on like the galactic as being kind of like a, a little bit of a higher end, more rare shiny card. So it was a pretty easy easy thing to notice i did write some of mine down uh 2012 lebron silver that one was like <laughs> one that everyone's made money on like a lot of these these have just gone up for everyone it's not like you know we had this crystal ball so much it's just like yeah. the card market as a whole has gone up and if, if you're holding lebron you did well but a few yeah. of these like you and i have done really well on you know galactic and silver prism so this one 2012 silver i paid 80 dollars in 20 that was 2016 though that was a couple yeah. years ago and i sold it for 2300 <laughs> uh and early this year as a psa 10 and then uh Giannis green pulsar i bought that like midway through last season for 30 bucks and i sold it for 375 once he got hot <laughs> late in the year it had to be like a month or two difference too if you bought it mid-year. Yeah, it wasn't that much. Yeah, that's quick. I feel like if you buy November, December basketball, you do pretty well. That's a pretty easy tip. Um, yeah. I'm still holding the 2015 and 2016 Galactic LeBrons, but I paid 1500 for the 2015 and 900 for the 2016, and those are well past that now, I think. Yeah, for sure. Those are the, those are the years to have in Galactics. Yeah, totally. I have kind of like reasons. flipped through the other years, but those two I'm holding. Yep. Um, 2018 LeBron Optic Hollow. That's kind of my big <laughs> one. I bought 10 of those at 30 a piece. Jeez. And I still have two PSA 10s, but I've sold a bunch of PSA 10s. I think I sold them yeah. at like 400 bucks a piece around there. Yeah, that was the one I missed, and I don't know how because I was. I saw all the prisms coming. Um, we need to talk about misses. Like I just did not see the hollows coming. The, and I don't know why I think I check on my cards, picked up a, a 2016 for $4. I flipped it for like eight and I felt good about it. <laughs> <laughs> so just to show you like, you know, yeah, I don't always see it coming, but for whatever reason, it was one of those things where it's like, I thought to myself, like, yeah, those hollows would probably be pretty good. And it just didn't do anything about it. And the next thing you know, you know, you're selling, you're buying 10 of them for 300 bucks total and selling one each for more than that. So yeah. 
that one was pretty nuts. And those are tough to grade now. I think now yeah. that they've caught on, they're getting tougher in grading them. So I graded them all pretty early. I think I got like six out of eight as tens. And Jeez. I have I haven't gotten a ten since. I've gotten like four nine <laughs> in a row. Yeah. Um, and I did buy a ton of. I bought a lot of the 2016 hollows too, because those were like 30, 30, 40 bucks as yeah. the prism stuff was spiking, and it just kind of seemed odd to me. So I bought a bunch of those, and those have jumped yeah. recently. Yeah, they yeah. have. My big like grade and flip was I paid. I bought a 2006 Topps Chrome Black Refractor LeBron for 500, yeah. and I sold okay. that as a 10 for like 2300. Jeez, nice. Uh, one of my misses was Mahomes, so I bought seven <laughs> raw at like 100, 150 a piece. Yeah, graded like four or five as tens, sold them all at 300 before the season. <laughs> yeah, you might have left a little something on the table, right? There's still like 700 even after all the stuff that's yeah. happened to him. Yeah, well, you know what? Hey, look, be happy that you get there's somebody else out there that's telling the story about how they bought them off some guy for 300 and now they have them for seven eight hundred so there you go yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta look at it but i think but i did i was right on baker i bought a bunch of baker stuff uh, yeah i was doing a lot of football uh you know in the off season and i paid 400 for his silver and i sold it as a 10 for 1200 before the season and i'm pretty Jeez. sure those have dipped yeah uh based on his performance it might be down a little bit <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of that's where I'm at. Uh, have you been updating your actual like tallies on your on the thread? Have you been keeping up with that? It's hard because I I, I had a computer that died at the beginning of the year, so all the history, all the the spreadsheet that was tracking it, kind of went away, and I rebuilt it. But I guess there's so much action that's taken place um, lately. It's kind of hard to keep up. Every once in a while, I'll do a periodic checkup. Plus. I go through phases where I kind of start accumulating. So if I see something like the LeBron silvers, right, I'll start accumulating them. And, you know, to a certain degree, I don't want to tip my hand by letting the whole world know that, Hey, I just bought, you know, eight LeBron prism silvers and I'm looking at more. But um, at the end of this video, when we go through, I guess what I picked up this summer, um, I'll go ahead and tip my hand with a few things and I'll show kind of everything that I'm, that I've been working on. Uh, because I, there's, you know, if you get into how it's done, it's, it's, you know, uh, there are a couple ways you could do it. You can go ahead and just try to pick the right player that you think's gonna, you know, blow up, or you can pick kind of the right set that you think's gonna blow up. Um, but you know, the kind of the key is to, you got to time it right. Um, if you buy what's hot right now, the guy everybody's prospecting, um, you know, a lot of times it's 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 hard for the car to really go up a whole heck of a lot more. Like I'm thinking about some of these hype rookies or second year guys, like you know uh, Michael Porter Jr. That a lot of people are flipping right now, and that a lot of people are investing in. But I don't know if the guy's going to pan out or not. But right now the bar is set so high that this guy's not a superstar, you know, it's going to be hard to to, you know, to flip or really make any money on them. So um, there's that and also just the timing of it. So like when in the year, um, there are times within the year, I think you alluded it to it earlier in November and December, is usually a good time to pick stuff up. There are times in the year where you can pick up guys that are under the radar and then times when prices are higher. So right now with the season starting, um, the prices on a lot of the younger guys have really shot up. Um, and then, you know, typically there's a period towards the end of the season where the playoffs are coming around the corner and, you know, you have a handful of teams that have legit title hopes and that's when the market really goes nuts for these guys. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a whole part of it too. It's uh, sort of the timing of it. Yeah. I always tell people to do the opposite of everyone else. And I know that's a big thing for you is like right in November, December is when everyone's hyped on rookies. So buy vets yeah. and yep. then when the rooks, eventually dip in you know as we get close to the playoffs then you can start buying them but i really wanted to touch on uh there's kind of two like major ways i see doing it, to invest in flipping this whole thing one of you know you touched on it but like the one is prospecting and the other is sort of you know buying the sets right like either you're you're betting on the player to pop or you're betting on the set or uh you know some sort of card that you believe um you do a little bit of both but your player 
flipping is a little bit safer, I would say. Like you're picking guys that you know are going to be good and they've kind of tailed down based on certain things and you feel, feel they'll go back up uh, or you're picking sets. Uh, is that is that true? Like how do you how do you pick the player in that case, I guess? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. So, you know, it's it's – I try to pick the, if I'm looking at a player, I'm trying to pick the guy who I believe in long term, but the spotlight isn't on them, right? Um, you know, if you buy, bought Kawhi the week after they won the NBA finals, that's pretty tough. Um, it's really tough to go up from there, right? But on the other hand, you know, one of the, I'll show you later, one of the big purchases that I made was buying by Ben Simmons when they got knocked out of the playoffs. Right. Um, you know, another big one was Anthony Davis. Once he wasn't traded to the Lakers at the deadline, they shut him down for the season. Nobody was paying attention to him, but he kind of knew down the road he's going to wind up in a big market somewhere. So, you know, the, the, fo- the focus was on Giannis and the focus was, uh, you know, on Kawhi and these other guys, you know, that, you know, hobby kind of forgets it for a while. And then, you know, things go their way, the hype machine starts back up and, you know, if they're good enough players, the spotlight kind of turns backwards. In them. Yeah. You and I even text like, oh, this guy's like out of the spotlight. But like we should be paying attention to him. It's almost like who, yeah. who screwed up recently? Let's go find that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and if it's not something that's kind of long-term career altering or just a sign that the guy isn't going to work out, well, he'll probably have his moment in the sun again. Yeah. I'm a little bit less uh, risk averse. I go for just like LeBron and, try to grade and flip or just wait and watch it go up. It's just a, it's a simpler game, I guess, but you can make a lot more money in the player flipping. I know for sure. Yeah. Um, I was watching LeBron in a preseason game and it's like, you forget how good he is. The great things he does. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, The the thing about LeBron is just like the longevity. Like you just look back at highlights from 2004 and it's like, Holy crap. That was like, you know, 15 years ago and he's still doing it. It's kind of crazy. Um, Let's jump to first off the line. How did you do this year with first off the line products? Yeah, so uh, that's one of the things that I've done um, pretty well with really since it started. Um, and I don't have any bots, unfortunately. I don't uh, have any special ins at the Panini or anything. I just kind of try to uh, grind my way through it like everybody else. And it, it, and it's it's good, but it's changing. I kind of knew this would, this would happen. So back when it first started, I was able to get in on every release because there really weren't that many people doing it. Now it's got almost like public attention. The shoe clippers are on it. There's bots you're fighting with, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've done well there, but um, now the game isn't just buy and sell right away. It's about buying and figuring out when to sell. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of how the car business and Zion Mania too. Um, how the collecting world has changed here and kind of is changing right now that a lot of people are kind of in this, you know, make profit off of it or do whatever they want to do with it. And there's a lot of, I guess, new people in it. Um, but you know, like, uh, the last immaculate release, uh, the collegiate immaculate, uh, Panini sold them for 400 and there were people selling the boxes for 425 a week later. And, you know, now they're on eBay for 900 Just, you know, people you know, kind of new to the game and we're thinking like, oh, gosh, I don't want to lose all my money. I better just go ahead and flip it. And after shipping, I'll make $5, not really understanding how loaded that product was. So it's just kind of the ever-changing dynamic that we're getting by being in a growing industry, which, you know, it's going to have its headaches. But overall, it's, it's awesome that it's a growing industry again. Yeah, didn't the uh, collegiate – uh, help me out here. That one that crashed Panini, that was like the first college product with Zion. Didn't that crash? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it was one of them. I think the first day it crashed, they had to restart it and reshuffle it for like a couple days later. They updated the website a little bit. Contenders, right? Wasn't it Contenders? Was it Was it Contenders? I think so. One of them that, yeah, they just booted it and said, we'll, you know, we'll be back next week. And that's a college product, man. Like that's kind of to your point of like more and more people are jumping in. So it's getting harder and harder. I haven't got one in since national treasures. Like it's been a while. I've just missed out or haven't gotten any boxes. It's just getting harder. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But, um, you know, he looked the way I look at it. It's, it's, it's almost like free money. So if I get it, I'm grateful for it. If not, you know, 
I'm not owed anything. So, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is, right? Are you still holding some of it? Yeah, yeah, some of it. I made a big um, sale. Actually, it's a blowout. Uh, you know, they their prices are pretty competitive, what they offer for their first offline stuff, and they're great to deal with. Um, it's total no headache situation. So um, just this week, I sold a pretty big lot, about 17 boxes I've collected over uh, the past year or two. Um, just to kind of get uh, my war chest built back up. So, you know, looking forward, next couple of months are going to be, you know, good buying months. And I think there's going to be good opportunities with how much attention the hobby is going to get. So I kind of wanted to, you know, build my uh, PayPal because I kind of have this thing in this flip quest. Whenever I have PayPal money, it disappears very, very quickly. <laughs> um, I can't hold money for, for very long, but for the most part, it works out pretty well. Yeah, I was actually going mean, to, I said this to you before we started, but one of the new tips that I've picked up, and it's worked really well for me in the last couple of months, is having a lot of cash on hand. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm like you, I usually don't have it very long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I've tried to be a little bit more diligent in the off season to hold some cash and build up some cash. And mm -hmm. uh, so when deals come across my way, it's like a lot easier to uh, jump on them, obviously, if you have cash as opposed to hold on, you know, move some stuff, you know. So yeah. having like, a good chunk of cash is a really good tip. I, I think it's worked really well for me. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, um, it's weird. It's just, I don't know if it just happens to be this way. Whenever I have you know, a decent amount of my PayPal, I find something else that I want to get in on. And, um, you know, I, I guess kind of how we do it is, uh, you mentioned earlier, I think, um, uh, you picked up, uh, two years ago, the LeBron silver for $80, right? Um, there's a pattern that I'm starting to recognize when things like that um, really start to appreciate. Um, so I told you I was trying to go after as many as the silver prisms as I could. And um, the one I could not find uh, other than the PC copy I have was the 2012. So this is going back to last summer, right? Um, and I picked up you know, my uh, 20 or 25 or whatever. And, um, they were getting harder and harder to find. So the supply started to dry up before the prices started to rise. Um, and I think that's the same thing that happened with the optics too, because even though I didn't buy any of them, I was watching them. So the optic hollows started to dry up before the prices really shot up. Right. It's not, um, you know, it's not like a, a linear climb where, um, the, the prices go up just as the volume starts to go up. So these under the radar things, you could, if you're paying enough attention, you could kind of spot that they're happening before, you know, the explosion price explosion actually happens. So you know, it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. I can feel a lot of people screaming at this video being like, yeah, it's easy for you to say that in November you made all this money, but what are you doing now? Right? Like, yeah. So I we think, are. uh, it's, it's a definitely like a constantly evolving thing. I know for us, like we're not, we're not still buying the same things we were buying in November. So now we've kind of evolved. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's definitely evolving. Yeah. The way the market is, there's always, there was always a next thing. There's always a new player. that's going to burst out or is underappreciated or, you know, kind of a, a next set that people are overlooking. That's going to be the next galactic. Um, that's going to be the next, you know, prism silver. And, you know, trying to get on that before it's too late, essentially, is, is you know, it's part of the game. And to me, that's what's pretty exciting. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I sold all my first off the line. I did not keep any of it. I don't have any right now. Um, I had yeah. quite a bit for, I was trying to hold the Luca year, you know, 2018, but uh, it wasn't, it wasn't doing much for me on my shelf. So I just flipped it. Yeah. Um, okay, let's jump to Zion. We have to talk about Zion. Um, <laughs> yeah, talk of the talk of the sport right now. Yeah. So first, uh, first question I have is like, what do you think he's doing for the hobby as a whole? And just kind of looking, you know, outside of just his cards in particular, do you think that like people coming in over the excitement of Zion are bringing positivity, you know, good money into the hobby as a whole? Yeah, I think I think anytime you bring attention to the hobby, it's a good thing, right? Especially to the scale that he is uh people think he's the next lebron whether that's right or wrong we'll see it's a tall order to be the next lebron but you know the way i see things getting people excited about the hobby whether they're new or they're coming back and and i know a lot of the old the, kind of the old time collectors get mad at the new blood in the hobby but 
you know, ultimately we're all new at some point or we all took a break and then came back and didn't know what the heck we were doing. That was like 2012 for me. You know, I had a 10 year hiatus and then I got back in and, you know, a lot of the new stuff didn't make sense, but you know, ultimately the way I see it anyways, is it's all good just to get people excited about what's going on. hundred percent. That's exactly what Zion is to me is he represents excitement for the hobby as a whole. Yeah. Um, so now specifically, are you going to try to get in on the, on the buying and selling of Zion? So here's, I've already done, I've already moved, um, my first off the line collegiate, um, you know, or uh, not the, I guess the prism was first off the line and then the, uh, um, collegiate immaculate. I already got in on those and I just moved, those are just some of the things that I moved to blow out. Um, not, I don't know, you know, collegiate project, product usually doesn't do that good, but I think if Zion pans out, he could change a lot. Um, so I've already done pretty well there. I have a bunch of prism pre-ordered from Walmart and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with it. So I don't open a lot of boxes. I just, I just don't. My one annual, um, you know, thing that I open is, is prism retail just cause it's always a great value. It's always a lot of fun. Um, so I'm probably going to, the day I get them, my hands on them, rip them open and you know, see what I can do there. Right. But other than that, I mean, we've talked about it before. Um, you know, a lot of times when the rookie stuff comes out, the initial hype is so high that if you buy in at the peak, when it first comes out, it has nowhere to go but down um, in the short term in the next year or so. You could look at it like with last year's prism. I mean, what, what Luca stuff came out at the very beginning, you know, the prism silvers and stuff, it's, it's, it's drifted down and it's not in a terrible spot. It hasn't gone to zero, but you know, people get so into the initial hype. Um, that it's hard to kind of buy at that hype and then hope to, you know, uh, you know, do well flipping it or anything like that. So, you know, it might be strategic. There might be a set that I really like that I think has potential that's under the radar and I get in on, um, you know, but you know, it's, it's, I don't think I'll be throwing all my money right off the bat at, you know, first sign to hit eBay. Yeah. Um, I would challenge people to go look at Luca prices after the initial wave of hype. It dipped yeah. pretty hard and it's actually come back pretty strong recently. Cause he, yeah. he looks very promising actually, you know, he's been looking really good in preseason. There's a lot of potential for him going into year two. So his stuff's gone up, I think for a fair reason. Uh, yeah. But anyone who bought right at the beginning of the hype is pretty much even at this point, as opposed to as if they waited a month, just if you wait like a month or two after the initial hype stuff will dip. Yeah. And then you can buy, if you really believe in that player, buy then. Well, it's just like, you know, earlier, you know, when, when, when all the attention is off, right? When he's the talk of the NBA um, and all the attention's on him, yeah, the prices are going to be pretty high. But at some point, like, unless you think New Orleans is going to make a finals run, um, at some point the attention is going to be on the Lakers or it's going to be on, you know, the Bucks or – the Clippers or Philadelphia or something. And I think that might be your opportunity when you know, everybody isn't trying to get in on him and kind of being selective about what you do. Yeah. Just by during the finals, you know that those guys aren't going to be there. The attention's all going to be on the finals, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was what I did with a few of my guys this, this last spring and it's worked out pretty well. Yeah. The Simmons is a good one during the finals. Cause everyone's like, Oh, he couldn't shoot. That's why they lost. And they just lost in the playoffs. Like he's done. We'll wait till next year. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll pay attention later. Yeah. Well, he was also being guarded one-on-one -on -one by Kawhi the entire series. So that kind of makes it a little tougher to do well. Um, you know, it's not exactly a scrub guarding you, but we, we were talking about it like as it was happening, it was like by Ben Simmons right now. Cause he's, this is no one's going to be lower than they are right now on him. Yep. No. Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask? Oh, so the Zion injury, <clears throat> are you worried at all about that for his future, the hobby's future at all? No, cause it's not, not, not yet. It's not catastrophic. Obviously I think they're going to treat him with kid gloves and not push it. Um, you know, um, if he starts two weeks, the NBA season two weeks late and he's looking like he did in preseason, nobody's going to remember that. Yeah. Um, the end of the season or come five years down the road, you know, when you start worrying is if it's a major injury or, or if it keeps happening or, you know, if his play is hindered because of it. So, you know, just the fact that 
you know, he's not going to be able to start the year. I mean, look, Ben Simmons missed an entire year with a broken foot. And, you know, he's doing okay. You know, yeah. Michael Jordan missed his entire second year in the, in the NBA. He played, like, only a handful of games. And, you know, Michael Jordan went, wound up to be a pretty good hobby. Uh, pretty good, a big hobby. Steph Curry. Remember Steph Curry <laughs> labeled as, like, injury-prone ankles? Yep. No. Yep, he had all those problems. So, you know, at this point, no, because it's a minor injury. But, hey, look, it's something he is a – We've never seen a guy with his build before do what he does. So, you know, if it starts becoming happening over and over again, yeah, then you might worry. But as of right now, it's, you know, it's something to keep your eye on, but it's not something to, you know, freak out about. Yeah. I mean, I think for us, we're just not buying regardless. So we're just kind of waiting and watching and see what happens. Focus on other guys. Uh, him, I think it was more just like him not playing in the first couple of weeks is going to take away some of the attention maybe from the products. I'm not sure. It might, but like just doing the easy math in my head, he might come back right around when Prism's coming out. So you know, that's house. you're gonna see. It. I mean, there's gonna be some Christmas shoppers weirded out by a bunch of really weird guys, you know, storming the card aisle at Target. They're not gonna know what the heck's happening. So uh, you know, if if if, if you accidentally click on this video or watching, you're not in the sports cards, like that's what's going on. There's a Scion guy. Uh, a bunch of sports card people are going nuts over him. Just don't be too alarmed, but, you know, don't let your kids too far out of the site. They might get trampled trying to buy Pokemon cards or something. <laughs> I'm just picturing all that at a Walmart right now. Uh, <laughs> right, let's jump to Gary V. Uh, I don't think we've talked about that at all on camera, so let's get let's get some of that going. Uh, I guess first, like, his impact on the hobby, positive or negative, what do you think? It's, um, you know, he definitely has his own strong viewpoint, right? Um, overall, it's probably, you know, again, anything that brings attention to the hobby is probably a good thing, right? Um, he's a very enthusiastic guy. Um, so, you know, if you know what you're doing, um, he gets some things right. Like, so his big thing where he made a splash was like, you need, you know, go ahead and buy all these Giannis prism PSA 10 rookies. Right. Um, and it worked out for him, right? He bought a ton of them and then I don't know if he ended up selling them or what, but they doubled in price and he at least understood the idea of, okay, this guy is going to be by the end of the year league MVP and this is his best card in the best condition. So I'm going to essentially hoard the card that everybody wants. Right. Um, so he, he understood that. Right. But you know, just, just like, uh, just like a lot of things that he says, you kind of got to take what he says with a grain of salt and understand that, okay, just because, you know, he's going to do this, I'm still going to think it through and see how it applies to my position. I probably shouldn't go out and get a credit card and go into debt buying, you know, Giannis rookies or De'Aaron Fox rookies because he says they're going to automatically triple in price. There are things that could go wrong that would cause that not to happen. Uh, but overall, you know, it's nice to see a public figure get enthusiastic about sports cards. Yeah. My big thing with him is just the expectation of it. Like if you go into it, you know, wanting him to come to the hobby and, you know, PC and do things a certain way, like, you know, that's not going to happen. So he has a yeah. reputation of coming in and trying to make money from things. So when it happens, like, don't be surprised. Uh, my big thing with him is like, I, I get the, you know, the whole prism PSA 10 thing. Uh, but for us, it's just not like, I'm not, I don't want to speak for you, but it's just not as interesting. Like that's just not like a, a fun way to flip for me. And a lot of flipping and cards is like how much fun we're having with it. And if I'm just like buying up prism PSA 10s of one player, it's just sort of like, you know, I might as well just buy stock. Like I might as well just go start researching stock and it's kind of like the stock equivalent of players. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't, it just doesn't take any like creativity or, or skill in my opinion. You're just kind of like picking a player. Well, to me, that's where the timing thing comes into, uh, comes into play. Right. So I can watch prices and see, okay, well this guy relative to other guys is just way too cheap right now because the spotlight's off. Of him, right. And, and that's when I kind of get into, you know, picking up a guy at you know half of what they're going for now. Again, I wouldn't spend my entire flip budget on just one guy's PSA 10 rookie over and over and over again. But it's nice to, I guess if you look at a portfolio, say like, all right, I'm going to slant it towards you know, this guy to a certain degree. And I think the Prism PSA 10 rookie stuff, same with Topps Chrome before that, is kind of like, it's kind of like the, 
the standard right now. So it's an easy way to do that. Yeah. But I definitely see where you're coming from, man. You cool. You find some, uh, some rare exotic stuff that's just, you know, other people haven't seen before yeah. and, and you know, it's hard to replicate. So, I mean, I don't expect Gary to do that even, right. He doesn't, he hasn't been in it long enough to know that kind of stuff. And this is kind of yeah. his way of doing it. So I respect it. And, and like yeah. you said, the, the, uh, you know, the excitement and people he's bringing in is, is kind of fun. So. Yep. yep. Sure. Uh, anything else on Gary? Um, no, just uh, yeah, entertaining guy. A lot of energy. Yeah, a lot of energy. It's fun. <laughs> um, so the big thing that's hit for you and me is eBay taxes. Yeah. Um, so what has that done to your style or your approach? Are you jumping more on the social media platforms and moving away from eBay, or are you just kind of taking that loss? Yeah. So you know, look, when it comes down to it, eBay is still the biggest platform. It gets in front of the most people and you have the most to buy from, but at the same time, it's getting costlier. Um, it's getting a little more riskier too because of the eBay resolution center and some of the issues they have there. So it's really starting, I'm really starting to use, I guess, cross platform, um, trading, um, if you want to call it that. So Instagram, Facebook, check out my cards. There are different groups that, um, you know, give you a, give you a place to kind of show off what you have, gauge interest and, and see what other people either have to sell trade or, or just to show off. And, 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 you know, it's a way to avoid any, a lot of the fees. It's a way to work with people that I guess you kind of trust more because if they're in a certain group, then, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, trust that they build up and reputation that they have to uphold. And in a lot of ways, I see the, you know, I don't think eBay is going to go away because it is such a big, big marketplace. But I, yeah, I see a lot, of, especially the high dollar stuff, uh, a lot of the transactions going through that. Um, and it's just better for communication too. If you want to find out about a card, you just direct message the person and, uh, you know, you can, you can kind of transact easier, I guess. So I don't know. What do you think? I'm sure you have a lot of good experience. Yeah, I, I personally haven't made a sale on eBay in months. Uh, I don't even know if it's because of the taxes, but at this point, like it's a lot more fun and easy to sell on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I mean, a lot of that has to do with like the network I've built up. So it's not fair to, to say that everyone should do it that way. eBay obviously has a monstrous platform and that's a great way if you're just getting started and it's kind of the easy way to sell. Uh, but like on Instagram, everyone that, you know, follows me or I follow, I know they like cards and I know that they like generally what I like. So it's a little bit easier. It's like a more specific audience where I don't have to deal with crazy low ballers on eBay. And I don't know, it's just <laughs> eBay's and the fees are just ridiculous. Like it's just, yeah. it's just, it eats into my, uh, into my profits. So it's a little bit tougher. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been doing a lot more on Facebook and Instagram and I enjoy those platforms. I think they're both really well catered to what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Plus, you know, it's, there's a little bit more collector to collector connection too. Yep. Um, you know, I just did a Facebook sale the other day and you know, I sold off a number of cards and it's going back and forth with people and, you know, they agree to buy something and say, well, what about this? Can you cut the price down? And, you know, just, Hey, okay, great. Yeah. I, I'm probably go down a little bit lower than I would just to kind of grease the deal because, you know, uh, having that collector to collector connection, it's, it's, you know, something I enjoy. Yeah. And to piggyback off that, there's kind of like a stigma on people that flip that we're trying to like gouge and screw everybody. Yeah. The people that I don't know about you, but the people I sell to are like ones that I've become friends with and I'm not trying to, you know, lie to them. I'm trying to be transparent that like, yeah, I bought this a few months ago. Like here's the current market value. You know, I, you know, you do a lot of deals with me. I'd love to give you a little bit of a, a break on the current market. Here's like the cost, right? it's not like we're nickel and diming. We're, we're trying to actually like follow the, the market as a whole and not like gouge and nickel and dime individual deals. That's a big difference. I think. Yeah. And again, it goes, it goes back to, you know, being honest about things and it goes the same on the buying end. Right. Um, we've all had that person that, you know, tries to talk you down by telling you how bad the card is or something and how it's garbage it's worthless. You should sell them for half of what you're asking for because you know, if not, you'll never sell. I, you know, I don't do that kind of thing. You know, that's not, you're not trying to do people. Um, I think making sure that a person knows what they have, 
um, and you make them a fair offer, and if they understand what their other options are, um, you know, that's, that's a fair deal and that's okay. So, um, you know, it's not about trying to rip anybody off. Um, it's not about trying to get one over on anybody. It's just, you know, about, uh, you know, making, making good deals. And if you can make good deals in an honest fashion, be smart about it, then, you know, it's like, it's like a win, win, win. hundred percent. And the, usually the people that I end up selling cards to at the end are happy and they get the card they want. And, and like the Mahomes stuff, those people are definitely happy. I sold it to them <laughs> way too early. Like yeah. you said, those people are happy too. And I'm, you know, we're all happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we all have different goals. Some people, you know, you need cash quick. Other people can sit on a card for a year and watch it appreciate other people. And I are buying for PC and, you know, I, I'll do all three. So there are PC cards that I've bought that haven't gone up in value. Yep. Maybe I technically overpaid, but I don't care. It's a PC card. It's sitting in a box, um, you know, in, in my man cave that, and it's never going to leave. Right. And the goal wasn't to make money off of it. The goal is because I've been trying to, you know, collect this for a long time and it finally came up and I had to overpay for it. That's awesome. Right. So I, somebody else probably made money off of me, but as a collector, I'm happy. Yep. Yeah. That's the other thing is there's, there's definitely flipping to only make cash. And then there's the way we do it, which is flipping to fund our PC and like grow and yeah. expand our, our collections. Like all the money that I've talked about, all these crazy, you know, eye popping numbers that I've had, I've all gone back into my collection and, making it just that much more enjoyable for me. So, uh, sure. yeah, that's another big part of it. Um, yeah. I want to, so why don't you jump into, uh, some cards, like what do you got to show in terms of cards you've been picking up or ones, <laughs> maybe some secret tips you got or. Yeah. So, so I figured this time I'll, I'll spill the beans and show, show everybody what I've picked up really the last year. Mostly, most of the stuff over, you know, in 2019, um, so it's also giving me an idea of what I think is going to do well come fall or, uh, excuse me, spring or next year or down the road or something like that. And it falls into really two categories. There's the, I guess you call it the hoarding that you said is boring, but for me, I think it's a, it's a good way to do this. And then there's the individual pickups. So we'll start with the hoarding and these are just going to be big piles <laughs> So this is what I told you, Anthony Davis, you know, trade didn't go through at the deadline. They sat him, but people, um, you know, kind of forgot about him. Prices dropped. So I spent a good amount of time picking up about, uh, let's see if we can see these, about 10 or so Prism rookies, right? So some PSA 10s all the way down to raw. Um, you know, and I was getting the Ross for $50 and I was getting the uh, Prisms for, or excuse me, the PSA 10s for I think, nine and a half for about 100, 125. Um, they've, you know, since doubled or a little bit more on the higher grade ones. Um, because again, you know, it was buying, it was the timing. So timing. Yep. people weren't paying attention and now, um, you know, people are paying attention. Now in his case, I'm still not ready to sell because I think people underestimate how good he is. Um, so I think there's still upside, especially if the Lakers are looking like potential NBA champions in the, in the, in the spring. Um, so, you know, even with where prices are at right now, also because it's 2012 prism and that stuff is so printed compared to what any other year of prism is. I mean, you can't even, you know, the fact that a raw Anthony Davis is still, I know people like Luca and people are excited about Luca. Only a few times more expensive than a Luca um, uh, Prism rookie. I mean, there are more um, Luca Prism Silvers graded than there are Anthony Davis base graded. And it's not close, honestly. <laughs> no, it's not close. Um, so, you know, if there's ever a spot where Davis does really hit the prime time, like a. Uh, like um, Giannis did, there's not going to be enough of those to go around for collectors. So that was the first horde. The second horde was kind of the, I talked about it earlier, about a dozen, um, uh, here, here, Simmons PSA 10s. And again, these were all picked up um, when they got knocked out of the playoffs for, uh, you know, 75 bucks, 85 bucks. Because, you know, you look at some of the other guys going for that price and it's like, okay, well, he's, 
probably a better bet than, uh, you know, a few of these other guys. So I went ahead and did that and those were for about 160. So it's been a good flip. And kind of my bull case for Simmons is that, you know, I look in the East and Philadelphia, you know, should be a top two team, if not the first seed team. So I think there's a chance there. Um, along with the same, uh, in the same note, um, picked up a lot of the silvers that were out there. So a couple PSA 10 hollows, um, some, uh, some, uh, prison silver rookies. Again, this one, they were going for about, you know, half as what, half as much as they're going right now. Um, when they got knocked out the playoffs. And then this one, just because it's a fantastic card, um, his, uh, rookie year galactic. Um, well done, sir. Yes, yeah, just just an all set. That one, if I have to ever move, will be will be tough to get rid of. Yep. That's the best looking year, in my opinion. And the fact that he doesn't have any NBA auto rookies or anything like that, um, there's only so many cards that you're going to look at as must haves if this guy really works out, and that's one of them. So um, the next is, I guess, this is. This is the one I debated tipping off because I'm still after these um, if at the right price. But, um, you know, in full disclosure, I think I will. So we all saw what happened with the uh, Chrome LeBron this summer when that jumped to $2,500 card, um, PSA 10. So uh, what I've been picking up is hoarding the Jim Mint copies of his red. So genius. Uh, it's like right so here. genius. <laughs> And this just goes to, um, not that I think it's ever going to be more than the Chrome, but this just goes to the, the things that make cards desirable um, is that they can be the ones that everybody wants, right? Um, so first off, interesting thing about the tops, uh, there are less legitimate tops base rookies than there are tops Chrome uh, for, for a couple of reasons. So, I have to imagine the overall print run of tops is probably greater, but as far as gem mint copies, there are actually uh, yeah, more tops chrome than there are regular tops. Um, yet it sells for about um, you know one sixth of what the tops chrome does, right? At least where I'm picking them up at. Um, so there's you know there's that again, it's it's not chrome; it doesn't have that. So I don't think it's ever going to catch up or pass it, but it's still it's a recognizable card. Um, you know, it's his tops rookie, right? Look at the trout tops rookie. I know that has different things going for it, but you know, if, if LeBron keeps becoming more and more legendary, that's a card you're going to point to is saying, Oh yeah, everybody wants that card. Yep. Um, so more specifically, actually, it's hard to see this, but, um, one of the gem mint tens is his first edition. Oh, nice. And, um, you know, there's only a hundred of those in gem mint tens. So hard to, uh, pretty rare card. And then finally, the uh, I guess the last of it is this is just cool stuff to show off. The the stuff that I still have um, that's uh, I guess my one off cards. I wish I could hoard more of these, but um, I can't. It's just hard to find. So this one is huge. Um, you saw the regular this uh, the first year silver. Uh, put this in perspective. I told you there's more Luca. Um, you know, PSA 10s silvers, and there are Anthony Davis base. So over a thousand Luca PSA 10 silvers. The pop on the uh, Anthony Davis silver is 18. I mean, put that in perspective. 18, like that's ridiculous. And I know the Luka, yeah, five, sorry, 500 times more Lucas. Yeah, and counting. Um, and I know the LeBron's even less. So people talk about like how, you know, people talk about that first year prism set. I still think that thing in, in top condition is, is undervalued. Um, especially with the top guys. So your PSA 10, your 9.5, I still think those are undervalued because that's, that's the iconic set of the decade. Yeah. Um, and silver prisms are like your, your gold standard. This is what everybody wants. And just how rare all those rookie, all those 2012 guys are. I mean, they're just, it, it's, it's astonishing. And if, if the, you know, a lot of collectors do realize that, but like if the masses ever realize that, yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit. So 
I can't do math. It's 50 times. So let's just do the math then. Luca PSA 10 silver prices are, are I think they're like 700 bucks, something somewhere around there. Yeah. And the Anthony Davis is what, like 2000 now? It's for a PSA 10. It's, it's, it's closer to three or four. I know the last one at when on a buy now 3000, but I literally think that guy left money on the table at auction. It would go for even more. Which so is still I, what four times, four to five times the cost of a Luca. And there's 50 times less than them. It's still the math doesn't even make sense. Right. And, and uh, you know, I think people will realize that, um, yeah, at some point, which is why I'm, I'm huge on these. I'm huge on that year. Which I would have got more. That's my biggest regret. Yeah. That I didn't just dive in a year or two ago on every PSA 10 or any silver I could get of a decent guy. Yo, I've so, had like three Kawhi PSA 10s, and I sold them all at like a thousand, and now they're like four, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's one that I screwed up on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you made somebody really happy. Yeah, <laughs> someone's got a bunch of those. Of it. There's, I think there's only like thirty Kawhi PSA ten silvers, and yeah, like you said, eighteen. So Davis is even tougher to grade. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's tough. So the next two I have to show off go to something that you do a really good job at, and I think if you're looking at kind of investing, flipping, it's a great opportunity to focus on is uh, cards that you can't find elsewhere. Right? If you can get like with the silvers, the reason they do so well, it's a card that everybody wants. Um, if you could, if you can get your hands on a card that people want but never come up and people can't find, then they do really well. So this was again uh, summer of eighteen. I think I got the last one of these before they took off, and it's a uh, LeBron fifteen Galactic. It's not a gem, mint, unfortunately, but. Uh, I think one of these has sold since I think you were the one that got it. I mean, it's literally been more than a year since the Bron Team Galactic has hit eBay. And I haven't seen one on social media or anything either. I didn't even know you had a nine. Yeah. You I mean, I didn't, know ball? Some of your other ones. I didn't know you had that one. Yeah. Look at us. We own two <laughs> of the, like, eight, eight copies, ten copies, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, they're hard to track down. I, think I haven't I, seen one since I bought mine late, and that was like right after we did our interview. I haven't seen one since. So that was a, in eBay you got it? Yeah. No, that was Instagram. Here, I'll show it real it quick. It was Instagram? I yeah. this on Instagram. And this is a, this is a pop one, was, man. So crazy. That's the fact that it's a pop one PSA 10. That's it. That's the best, best LeBron Galactic that will ever be made. Yeah. That's it. That's the thing, dude. There's no, like you said, there's no... There's no yeah. way to replicate that card. No, you're not. It's 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 the type of thing I, I won't say I'll never sell it, but I plan on moving it 10, 20 years down the road if I want to. And then again, I might not, right? Uh, so the other one that I have, I have kind of a – it really pairs better with yours than, um, than my LeBron was – Kind of that same vein. So that paid three thirty for this in summer of two thousand eighteen. Um, you probably know what's coming, but look at this: a uh, Giannis BGS ten Galactic, um, which is ridiculous. So there are only five uh, Galactic here that have graded ten uh, BGS ten, and the fact. Uh, you know, first year Giannis. I mean, again, it's the best Giannis Galactic they'll ever be made. And just in case he becomes the next guy, you know, I don't I want to move it for a long, long time. So, I think we have the two best Galactics in existence. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's uh, which is pretty neat. Um, actually, I have a pretty good one for my PC. I think you know what it is. Part of this flip thread. It's a, uh, it's not a 15, but it's, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty nice galactic too. And that, that Simmons is no slouch either, you know, being like one of the few rookies that you can get of a galactic since they didn't start till 2015. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of the, uh, he's one of the bigger guys you can have for sure. So, and the, the last thing I want to show that's part of my flip thread, it's the end of the story. So after I spent a hundred, it's kind of cool to watch this go on. After I spent 130 on the, 
other Giannis Galactic that I sold for a thousand. Bought the uh, select black, sold that for four thousand. Took the majority of that money, and again bought when nobody was looking, and picked up the this AD and uh, National Treasures. And what's really cool about this card is you see that really, really, really. Yep. I see it. I mean, boring two-color patch. To me, this sold the card because that patch is real. And that patch is how it came out of the pack. Um, a lot of the, this is, this is part of the whole problem with all the patch faking and doctoring of cards. A whole heck, a lot of those, uh, Davis rookies have fake patches. Now there's a whole database on blowout about all the fakes. Um, this one was real. And actually the guy that did the database found the video still on YouTube of this card being pulled. You can wow. tell by the serial number. So, so to me, I mean, you know, you know, this is authentic. You know, it's, I'd much rather have a boring two color jersey than an awesome, awesome three color jersey that, you know, really wasn't part of the card and has been doctored in, right? Yep. Um, so that's, I guess, the uh, you know the third leg of this original hundred thirty dollar flip that's gone all the way up to this you know AD National Treasures. I think it's really smart to. Uh to consolidate your flips up into something big that you can kind of hold a little bit longer. That's stuff. That's 100% my strategy. Like I kind of yeah. dabble in the low to mid range stuff and then eventually like lock it into something really big and then wait and see what happens to that, uh, you know, longer term and then just rinse repeat, start over from the beginning and build up something big again. And then at the end you've got 10 big, huge cards that you love. And yeah, like that's kind of how it works. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what makes it, fun right and and you know so like i said these galactics i'll probably hold on to for a long time these anthony davises you know i might I wind up keeping one or two of them for a long time but most of them i'll probably move away from but just for a year or two you know that's that's a pretty neat part of the collection i mean the guy that, like trust me there are days when i miss that janice select one of one um but it's still cool to have it for you know, for a little while that I did have it, you know, and that's, I guess, part of the job of it. Yeah. That's why I always tell people to do the Flickr sold album. I feel like I still own all those cards I've sold. <laughs> yeah. To a certain degree. Right. Uh, yeah. You gotta enjoy like cards you've owned in the past. It's fun. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right, man. Uh, um, I guess I could maybe give one tip. So like it's been prism and then optic and I'll let the <laughs> viewers figure out what the next shiny LeBron card is. I won't, I'm not going to give it away here because I'm still in the process of buying a lot of them, but I do. Have a lot. <laughs> nice. Um, it's the next shiny LeBron and I've been paying $4 a piece on average. You can do that. Um, yeah, you can do that. So, you know, I, I, I will give it away. And this is, if anybody's out there, like, look, um, you know, there's some, some stuff I paid a lot of money for. Josh, I know you've paid stuff for money for stuff that makes me feel, uh, you know, uh, a little, uh, a little, uh, overwhelmed, right? It doesn't have to start out that way. You can find something for $4 ends up being $40 or $400 a year or two later, if you know what you're doing. And, you know, kind of follow what we talked about, kind of finding that pattern. And if you spot something, yeah, that's how it all gets started. Yep. Yeah, my other so my other big one is LeBron Golds right now, which you know isn't feasible <laughs> for a lot of people, but uh, it's yeah. it's a fun project for me, and I'm getting close to completing the Topps Chrome Gold run for LeBron. I think I only need two more, uh, and those have been fun. And also, you know, I've garnered quite a bit of attention towards some of the <clears throat> older gold stuff since there's been so much attention and hype on the Prism. I figured the older Bowman finest. Chrome stuff deserves some more some more love in the price category, so I grabbed a bunch of those. Yeah, that'll be uh, that'll be something you'll have to show off when you nab all the golds. Yeah, the 2005 one is just kind of ugly to me. I don't know if I want it. It's like they got that brown border. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but you kind of have to though, right? <laughs> I mean, in 2006, once I grab that, that's the toughest one to find. Now I got to finish. Yep. <laughs> I mean, the rookie obviously was tough, so. You're in deep, man. You got to go for it. 
<laughs> All right, Tom, appreciate the time. This was fantastic. Uh, I hope people, you know, learned a lot from this and I hope they enjoyed the uh, part two and uh, maybe you can beat your own record for most views on Cardboard Chronicles. All right, man. It was great talking with you, Josh. Thanks, Tom. All right, thanks.